and pupil services leadership academy. Um, just a couple of Zoom etiquette notes. Um, please mute your microphone unless you're asking a question and remember to turn on your camera um, to participate fully. Uh, we welcome again to the Special Education and Pupil Services Leadership Academy. This academy is brought to you um, in partnership from Wisconsin Regional Special Education Network, the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction, and the Wisconsin Council of Administrators in Special Services, WCAS. I am Tanya Anderson Ruskin. I am the RSN Director for CESA 10. We're excited to have you join us today. Our format's a little bit different this year. Um, we're trying to be more inclusive to meet the needs of all of our directors in the state of Wisconsin. Our agenda has been shared in the chat and you're also gonna see some directions too about renaming yourself. I know I had to rename myself as I came in. So um, please feel free to check that out, um, those links in the chat. All right, so we're also gonna be sharing in the chat a link to a survey. So our agenda for the school year is pretty tight. We try to collect your responses to the, the needs that we're seeing out in districts. Um, but as we know, we go into the school year, new guidance comes out and we wanna make sure that we can be responsive to updates that happen. So um, the, the survey that you're gonna see in the chat is connected to the specially designed instruction guidance that came out as well as the functional behavioral assessment bulletin and just general feedback. So if you are willing to, to take that survey, give us some feedback just about questions that you're seeing or um, relating to implementation, we gladly accept that. Um, and then we can craft meaningful um, series for you in the future as well. Just a reminder that WCAS is offering WCAS conversations. They occur the day following these series, and they are from noon to one o'clock. Um, the session, unfortunately, for tomorrow is full, but the session that will be happening in November, November 9th, is still open. And so we welcome you to go to WCAS, check out those series offering, and just know that they're a resource for you. WCAS is also offering a five-part legal learning series, so they are going to cover um, applications and legal considerations. Some of the topics that they will cover are Section 504, FBAs and BIPs, uh, using student needs to determine least restrictive environment, parent relationships, and other things such as um, expulsion, obey, obeyance, shortened days. Um, so again, that you can go to the WCAS website and you can find more information about that. Uh, Gail Anderson, who's also on this call, um, is a contact for those activities. All right, for today, we'd like to remind you that we do have a participant folder. You can find resources in that folder. Um, there's also a parking lot. The parking lot is for those questions that you have that we wanna make sure we get the most up-to-date information for you. So we will update um, the responses to those questions um, in the parking lot, and you're free to add your cont contact information if you'd like to do that. Again, the agenda for today is in the chat. But we will be having three guests, Seth Bishop, Barb Novak, and Paul Sherman. Um, both Seth and Barb will join us for the first hour of the day, and then Paul will join us for the last hour. And uh, Seth will be covering an overview of the data snapshot. Barb will be covering um, equitable multi-level systems of support, so the EMLSS project. And then Paul Sherman's here to give us an overview of Section 504. With that, I would hand it off to Seth Bishop. Thank you. I, I do see someone has their hand raised. Uh, Rachel in uh, CISA 7. Uh, is there a question, Rachel, before I launch into my presentation? Sorry. Nope. Just trying to use too many screens. Hey, All thanks, right. Rachel. Uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, as I have a presentation, a PowerPoint to share with you all. Seth, you're a little quiet. You're on the quiet side. Okay, let me see if I can adjust my uh, speaker volume. Thanks. Is this better, worse, or the same? It's better for me. All right. Uh, this option will have more side audio, uh, but um, hopefully my dog doesn't, you know, see a suspicious leaf outside or something and launch into a, a barking frenzy. <laughs> Um, all right, uh, so um, uh, the data snapshot. 
uh, it is coming up in just about a uh, little over a uh, little under two months. Uh, so now is the time to start having this conversation about what the data snapshot uh, looks like, what you should do, et cetera. Um, uh, we're going to go over a couple things here first. Uh, why does it matter? Um, timelines you should be aware of and then how to quality assure or QA your data uh, using two tools. Uh, one is the special ed uh, data quality emails that I distribute, as well as WISE-Secure. Um, so why does the snapshot, uh, why does the snapshot matter? Uh, first and foremost, once the snapshot happens, you cannot change your official data. Um, while there are mechanisms to submit corrections for things like report cards, that does not change certified data that we have to use for uh, federal reporting. Um, and not all of those were able to transfer over for special ed purposes. Uh, so I incorporate as many of those corrections as I reasonably can, uh, but uh, because uh, most of the federal uh, accountability that I do is a one-man op operation, and it's just me. Um, there's only so much I can do to uh, incorporate those different things. So, um, for example, submitting graduation corrections to OEA for report cards will not change uh, special ed uh, grad exiters uh, from special ed uh, in LEA determinations. So, that's the first important thing to remember. Uh, furthermore, when you get snapshot of data uh, that's incorrect, you can submit a data errata, but that doesn't change the fact that, uh, that the data was submitted incorrectly. That is basically just a public statement saying, yes, we know this data is inaccurate. Here's what happened, but it doesn't change the actual data. Um, uh, you can change your current data uh, at any time, uh, and that updates nightly into WiseDash, but certified data, the data that we use for federal and state accountability, uh, comes from the snapshot and has to come from the snapshot. We cannot use current data for most indicators. So that's the first reason why the data snapshot is important. Seth, I have a question. This is Brenda, yeah. the RSN from CISA 8. So if a district submits an inquiry, like for the report card, for graduation data that's inaccurate um, and that's acknowledged, the data that's um, fed into the spring 2024 JFN for graduation is lag data. Therefore, if that data is inaccurate, that's the data that will be in their JFN LEA determination. It is what it is, right? Correct. Thank you for that clarification. Yep. Thank you for asking. So <clears throat> speaking of LEA determinations, inaccurate data uh, will affect your, uh, your LEA determinations. Um, and this can happen uh, both directly and, in, and indirectly. So for example, let's say uh, some of your graduation data was inaccurate and several kids who should have been counted as special ed graduates uh, were not, uh, you know, that they might have, uh, the IEP might have not extended all the way to the end of their enrollment, for example, and then they were counted as uh, uh, students without IEPs who graduated, and therefore you wouldn't get credit for them. Um, but also it can happen indirectly, because if we know that uh, there is a data error, then uh, the timely and accurate data, you'll lose points for timely and accurate data, um, which is one of our compliance indicators. Uh, any data that we know to be incorrect um, uh, gets calculated in terms of uh, uh, each student and each snapshot, and we create a, uh, we, we calculate a, uh, a rate, and if it's uh, below, 99% uh, accurate, then you'll lose points. The reason we use 99% accurate is because of smaller 
uh, districts where uh, a single uh, student may represent, you know, uh, 0.5% of their student population. Um, uh, we understand that some errors are going to happen sometimes, and we don't want to, to be overly punitive, um, and therefore we don't use the, the general guidance of 99.95% accurate data, which is sort of the, the standard uh, for data accuracy um, uh, in, in the data world. Uh, so it's only 99%, but that's still not a lot of kits for a lot of districts where you can have inaccurate data and still earn two points. Um, <clears throat> so here is, is the example of incorrect IEP end dates, um, which can lead to students with IEPs being counted as returning to regular ed instead of graduating as a student with an IEP. Um, that is something that we've got a lot better at detecting and uh, and we encourage you all to check your data carefully about this because a number of LEAs have gotten burned uh, by this error in the past. Uh, lastly, why does it matter for public accountability purposes? Um, I cannot impress upon you how many different people and organizations use this data uh, from researchers to journalists, legislature, uh, et cetera, um, at best inaccurate data hinders important research and oversight. And at worst inaccurate data can result in inaccurate and usually negative public attention and fiscal implications uh, for a district. So it's incredibly important that all your data is as accurate as possible because otherwise you can get some attention your LEA probably doesn't want. So moving on to timelines, when do the snapshots happen? There's always two snapshots uh, in Wisconsin. The December snapshot, and that's really the main snapshot, that's the one we're, con we're concerned with here, um, and the spring demographic snapshot, which is uh, in May and is just used for demographics attached to assessment data. So the December snapshot this year is scheduled for December 5th, 2023. Mark your calendars, um, and that includes data for the third Friday of September and October 1st count dates for this school year we're currently in. And it also includes year-end data for the previous school year. So uh, attendance, discipline, graduation, all of these things that get snapshotted uh, uh, during this time, even though it happened at the end of last year, <clears throat> we give you the whole summer and, and, and fall semester of school to, uh, to get that data, uh, you know, in your systems correctly. Um, DPI communications gradually ramp up two months out. This is an example of that communication, uh, this presentation. Um, but uh, you'll also get calls, emails from a bunch of different people across the agency. Hopefully they're not too repetitive, but if we see a problem, we really do try and, and uh, reach out in multiple ways to make sure that it gets addressed. Um, the spring demographic snapshot, again, is usually much smaller. There's less of a to-do about it. Um, uh, we don't do nearly as much outreach, but it is still important. Uh, it's used for district and school report cards and account accountability purposes. And uh, that is the data that gets attached to assessment data. So the assessment results themselves get sent to DPI from the vendors of the assessment. But we still rely on districts to send updated demographic information about the students that get attached to those results or lack of results. So no non-tested students are still an important part of our data uh, uh, that gets included in accountability for, uh, you know, uh, assessment participation and so on. Excuse me, I need to cough. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, 
so smaller, but still important. I think the main takeaway is, you know, before you uh, uh, pack up uh, for the school, uh, for the end of the school year, uh, make sure that your assessment, uh, that your uh, demographic data for the spring semester is as clean as possible. So come, uh, you know, uh, come May, uh, uh, things are, are looking good. So how to QA your data, um, there are two ways that I'm going to talk about. One is the data quality emails I distribute. Um, uh, these are two emails sent to special ed directors and assistant directors. They come, <coughs> they come six weeks out, uh, which this year would be about October 24th. Uh, and that goes to all LEAs. And then uh, two weeks out, we send another round, but those are just to the remaining LEAs with suspected errors. <clears throat> so the two week out email, no news is good news. That means that we're not seeing anything so flagrantly wrong that, uh, that we're you know, giving you homework, uh, but <clears throat> it's still a good idea to uh, you know, go and, and check your data thoroughly uh, two weeks out, even if you don't hear from me. Uh, I also recommend that you check our uh, uh, special ed director's contacts uh, list uh, in our uh, uh, school district contacts directory. Um, uh, I'll see if I can throw, oops, I'll see if I can throw that in our chat here. So because I know you can't click on my presentation. Speaking of your presentation while you do that, Seth, would you be able to share this with me after today and then I can share it with Absolutely. these folks? Absolutely. Great, yep. thank you. Sorry, I'm having trouble uh, getting back into the chat. Oh, there it is. Seth, there's also a question in the chat. Would you like me to read it to you? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Sure. Um, Seth, can you provide clarity in some form regarding students with IEPs who are not graduating, but who are continuing to stay until 19, 20, 21? When do those students get counted? And are they counted against the LEA determinations if they stay beyond the four or five year cohort? We also have a lot of students with IEPs at 16, 17, 18 who are transient. I know they have to be in the numbers for a certain amount of time in the LEA in order to be counted, but could you clarify? So two questions. Yeah. So, so this depends on where the data is being used. For, uh, for report cards, for uh, school and district report cards, uh, that those come from state legislation and state legislation allows us to uh, uh, include a FAY requirement. So full academic year, if they aren't in the setting for a full academic year, they don't get counted in that data. We do not have that exception for uh, federal accountability. <coughs> Excuse me. So for federal accountability, if a student is enrolled, and you are the you know you are the last known enrollment for that district for that year. They are included in your graduation data, regardless of whether they were there for the full year or not. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. <clears throat> One moment, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute and uh, and try and resolve this this persistent cough. <clears throat> All right. Um, the other question about uh, students who are continuing in special ed, um, this depends again on where it's being reported. Uh, for, uh, you know, school uh, and district report cards, they would be included in whichever cohort they, they are in. So the four-year rate, the five-year rate, six-year, et cetera. For LEA determinations, things got wonky because of changes in federal 
uh, federal accountability for uh, under IDEA and the feds change to a separate measure that looks at uh, uh, graduation exiters or excuse me, yeah. It just said the host muted me. Can you hear Sorry, me? Sorry, Seth, that was by accident. Okay, that's okay. I was doing way too many things, <laughs> so I'm sorry. That's quite all right. So, so yeah, the uh, the the other um, the the changes in federal guidance required us to rethink how we did uh, uh, graduation counts for LEA determinations. What we do now for LEA determinations, uh, we call the grade twelve cohort. So. The grade 12 cohort means that when a student graduates, they will uh, be counted in the numerator, regardless of how many years it takes. So you'll get credit for those kids. That part is good news. The downside is until they graduate, they're included in the denominator. Um, so uh, if it takes a couple years, they'll, they'll quote unquote count against you until they count for you. Because of that, however, that is why we set our graduation targets where they are. We don't expect any graduation rate for a year to be 100%. We don't even expect it to be 90%. Um, a full 15% of students uh, could continue on for another year uh, without it counting against you. So <clears throat> before you get too upset <laughs> about that measure, keep in mind, we're allowing for 15% of students not to graduate in four years, uh, students with IEPs specifically. So uh, that, is, that is the system we're using. Um, people have asked if we could change it and we have presented options to our leadership and uh, there is no better option than this, unfortunately. So I understand your frustration. Um, we're not trying to penalize anyone for providing services beyond 18 to students who need it. Um, but we also have to set reasonable goals in terms of how many students are graduating on time. Um, and that's how we have to do it. Any other questions before I, I screen share uh, the data quality email? I was just going, oh. You have a raised hand, Seth. I think I have. Yeah, Heidi. I think I'm like river reading. I'll put it in the chat <laughs> or, oh, is that better? Oh, I think that the issue, I appreciate you clarifying that, but I think that why people, myself included when I was a director in a district struggled is because we had a high, we were encouraging good transition, which was fine. But then we also had a high transient population of students with IEPs moving in and out due to our demographic. And so it was almost like a it those things converge because of the fact that while on the report card, they didn't necessarily count unless they were um, a year in because they may have moved in. We had students, some students move in three times in and out of our school when they were 17, 18 years old, and then they would drop out, right? Like we were trying to keep them, but I'm just, I just want you to know that other side of it. It's not just this singular issue. It has multiple facets to it and why even 90 or 85% seems high. And it's not because we don't want kids to graduate and we don't want to make bad decisions for kids, but just so it, that, that is, that point is made that it's multifaceted. Yes, I understand that the 15% does include other students uh, that, that may move in and out as well. Um, uh, what percentage of your students uh, uh, are eligible for 18 through 21 services? Are you talking to me? Uh, yes, sorry. 
Oh, I'm not in a district anymore, so I wouldn't ah. have accurate counts. I just moved from a district to a CISA role. Um, but I would say that we had, um, we were having more students stay beyond 18 because we were developing a really good program. So anywhere from five to 10, I mean, and that's just each in that 18 to 21 year old program from what I remember last year in moving in. All right, thank you. So the other thing to keep in mind uh, for LEA determinations is we also, it's not just the 85% cutoff, we also use tertiles as safety nets. Um, so at least one third of all districts will earn two points regardless of uh, um, their score uh, if if a third aren't uh, uh, if a third of districts don't uh, meet those that that uh, cutoff the eighty five percent cutoff um, and no more than a third of districts will ever earn uh, zero points um, so this this is how we try and balance it to make sure that you know um, there's some leeway and and we're not you know like this, this was a blessing for COVID, uh, for example, because if we didn't have this system, a ton of districts would have would have uh, uh, been in trouble because of uh, assessment participation because people didn't want to go into schools to test. Um, but we were able to to accommodate that because of the turtile. So that is another mechanism that we use to make sure that um, we're not. Uh, we're not uh, uh, penalizing uh, uh, districts or holding them to too high a standard. So let me share uh, a screen cap of a data quality email that was distributed last year. If I can find it, there we go. So this is an example of a data quality email. This is one for MPS, which I share because the, the counts are so large that uh, um, uh, the, most of this data would be uh, publicly discernible. Um, and uh, none of the email, uh, none of the data that we email would be considered confidential. Um, uh, it's, it's not, something that could be used to re-identify students. Um, uh, it's at too high of a level uh, to do that, um, uh, but it does give you a snapshot of, or a, a picture, I should say, of, of, uh, of data quality and, and persistent issues. So uh, six weeks out, this was Milwaukee's uh, situation last year. Um, we provide a, stu a count of students with IEPs because sometimes people haven't uploaded all of their IEP data um, and uh, that number would be zero. Clearly it wasn't for Milwaukee. Um, we uh, identify students with age uh, or grade and environment conflicts. So um, uh, for example, uh, kindergartners who are uh, still using the pre-K codes uh, uh, for ed environment, um, missing ed environment so just it hasn't been uploaded at all um, and then uh, students with developmental delay who are age 10 plus uh, who uh, that is invalid so this is an example of something which should always be zero um, ideally all three of these would be zero um, uh, SDD is valid for ages nine and below um, Beyond that, uh, you have to uh, identify a different uh, uh, disability reporting category if the student uh, doesn't still uh, need an IEP. Uh, we also provide demographic data broken down by October 1st, third Friday of September, and uh, year end, which here we just call BRAD, um, but it includes all year end data. Um, uh, it's, uh, it includes missing disability, missing grade, missing race, missing gender, missing English language proficiency. Um, uh, 
these are things that uh, you can review in wise-secure um, and confirm. Uh, keep in mind that um, uh, occasionally there is a small discrepancy between the numbers reported in this email and those which appear in wise-secure. Um, in such instances, wise-secure is considered the master record. So if I see a problem or if I identify a problem in this email, but it's not replicated in wise-secure, that's okay, rely on wise-secure. Uh, this is the nature of, of big data. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, replicating polls exactly from our database um, is extremely difficult because there are so many different moving parts. Uh, I've gotten it very close, but there's always gonna be, uh, you know, a small discrepancy here and there. We also include high school completion data, as well as a percent change. Uh, this is a way to highlight uh, uh, students with IEPs who may have been coded incorrectly as, as returning to regular ed instead of uh, graduating with an IEP. Um, and uh, uh, enrollment and special ed exits as well. Uh, down at the bottom here, we have a quick list of definitions, because I use a lot of abbreviations up here um, uh, to help you sort of navigate that, as well as some links to uh, our website for relevant stuff. When you get this, if you have questions, instead of contacting me, uh, you submit a WISE help ticket. Uh, and that is because while I generate these emails, I'm not as well versed in all the different uh, student information systems. And also, uh, I am uh, neck deep in uh, other federal accountability stuff uh, as the snapshot is going on. So I can't field questions from 450 LEAs. Um, but our uh, WISE Dash support, uh, I share all this information with them, and they should be able to help or at least triage. So if there's something they can't answer, then they'll come to me um, and, uh, and we'll figure it out together. Seth, I have a quick question and yeah. I, should know, I should know the answer to this and I'm no a problem. little embarrassed that I don't. Um, if someone needs to update their contact information in the directory, how do they, who do they contact? So that is actually done through uh, the, the school district. So the school district uh, updates that. Um, uh, I believe it would be the same person as their uh, district's uh, security administrator, okay. um, which in a lot of smaller districts is their superintendent. Yep, um, yep. Uh, it, sorry, go okay. ahead. Okay, nope. I, and so is that done through um... Wise data, wise uh, grants. Yeah, I'm. It's not wise grants. I believe it would be wise data. Uh, okay. But I can also look that up and share that with you after the fact if there's a specific website that they go to. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> uh, so the the other way to QA your data is through Wise Dash Secure. Uh, there you can log in anytime. You don't have to wait for the two emails uh, that I send. Um, you go to snapshots um, uh, and there are all sorts of helpful tools to slice and dice your data and look at aggregate counts. Uh, you can even click on those numbers and pull up student level views um, uh, uh, to uh, sort of check against your own knowledge and say, you know, uh, Susie Q, uh, you know, uh, I know was in a regular uh, classroom 80% of the time or more, but here they're coded as 40% of the time. So, uh, you know, let's trace down that error and it's so on. So a uh, variety of tools, both at a high level and at a uh, low level to uh, QA your data. To just show you what that looks like real quick. I have to refresh my browser. Oops, that's not it. There it is. So you go to snapshots, you select the 
the snapshot you want to QA. So although we take all of these at once, they're they're considered separate uh, categories. So TFS, Oct1, attendance, discipline, year and completion, uh, those would be the ones we're really uh, concerned with right now. Um, <clears throat> so let's say we wanted to look at third Friday of September. There's an unknown error right now, um, probably because I, I timed out uh, in my login. There we go. And here, you know, you can you set your district, set the the information that you care about, um, you know, uh, and uh, you can scroll all the way down, and you'll see a uh, light lime green and lavender backgrounds. The lime green is current view. Lavender is snapshot view. Naturally, snapshot for this year wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be there because it hasn't happened yet. But you could basically it's designed so you can QA against your previous year of data to sort of see how things compare and if things are looking roughly the same. Uh, but this is how you navigate to that page, and then when you click on the numbers, you can pull up student level views. So this is an example, names are masked obviously um, uh, for this presentation, but um, you can pull up their disability status, disability, et cetera, and really identify where there's missing or erroneous information. And then once you identify that, you can go back into your SIS, correct the information, lock it, and, and it'll push it to uh, to Wise Dash that night uh, and should be reflected in the view the next day. So I know I dumped a lot of information on you. Um, are there any other questions uh, before I turn things back over? Are we seeing any other questions in the chat? I am not. I just want to also thank all of the other directors on the call who dropped information on about how to up, um, update your um, contact information in the directory. Thank you all. What a great, perfect, great team effort there. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> I, I think I thank you as well, because that's that's something I never have to do. So I, I don't know Ex how to do it. So I know exactly. Um, I was yeah, like, I, I should know this, but I don't. <laughs> Are there any last questions for Seth? Let me check the parking lot really quick. I just want to make sure. Um, there was just a request to get the presentation. So Seth, when you get a chance today, if you can send that my way and I can get it uploaded into the folder and we can also um, send it out to folks via email. All right, sounds good. Thanks again, Seth. That's important to know that our, our data is accurate and then how that data is used. So we appreciate that update. Awesome. All right. Then Thank we you, are. Seth. Yeah. And thanks for the great questions, too, from everyone out there. Um, we are going to move on to both Barb Novak and Janine Mealy are both on the connection, and they are going to be talking to us about the EMLSS project. So, Barb and Janine. Hi. Good morning. So nice to be with all of you today. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Um, Janine, can I, because I need to leave at 1055, can I ask you to share your screen instead yeah. of um, causing chaos later? No um, first of all, just a huge thank you for being a director of special education. Um, your role is important anytime. Um, it's especially important now in challenging times of teacher shortages, administrator shortages, attacks on student identities. Um, you are on the front lines of all of that work. Um, and that matters. And um, here at DPI, we see you and we appreciate that. 
I am Barb Novak. I'm an education consultant on the special education team at DPI. You may know me from my days as a literacy consultant, which were not all that long ago. Um, and I'm going to let my colleague Janine introduce herself. Mm, Janine Mealy, I am the one of the coordinators, the project coordinator for the EMLSS project, and I'm based out of CISA 1. We're so as well as a coach at, within the project. Excellent. We're so glad to have you as part of our leadership team and part of our larger team, Janine. One of my responsibilities, um, all of my responsibilities at DPI circle around systems change. And one of those responsibilities is to serve as the grant director for the EMLSS project. And Janine and I are not gonna ask you to do anything. Nothing is required of you as a result of this presentation, as a result of this learning. In fact, instead, we are here to offer you, your district, your schools, your students, your teachers, free services. <laughs> so um, Janine, if you, thank you. Um, we're gonna quickly give you an overview of Wisconsin's framework for equitable multi-level systems of support or EMLSS and give you an opportunity to understand understand how the EMLSS project um, can support your district. So what you see here is Wisconsin's framework for an equitable multi-level system of supports. This framework has been in existence as you see it on your screen since 2017. It's an outgrowth of Wisconsin's model for RTI, which came about around 2010. Um, and you can still see that original model in the center of this graphic. The framework is a way to think about continuous improvement. So it is a way that you can think about any and think about or think through any improve any improvement effort, whether that's academic or behavioral or um, school mental health or any other thing that you might be working on. Um, one of the goals of the project is to emphasize intentionality and cohesion between improvement efforts. So when we say you can use this framework to think through any one of your efforts and to think across your efforts, you absolutely can. And as a project, we have already been, we've only been in existence for is it 10 weeks now, Janine? Maybe it's nine weeks, something like that. We basically yeah. came to be in early August. Um, we are already using the framework as it relates to federal identifications, um, making connections to the school mental health framework, talking about a continuum of behavior supports, um, and moving into work around EMLSS for math and EMLSS for literacy. So in terms of the goals of the project, the project will provide certain services to schools and districts. Those services include facilitating of trainings and professional learnings for teams, as well as providing coaching and providing technical assistance. This is all to support those schools and districts with utilizing an EMLSS framework. Um, in order to accelerate the achievement for learners, um, with IEPs and learners of color. The project is utilizing a statewide model for EMLSS framework and is also utilizing a single statewide model for a continuum of behavior supports, so PBIS. The priorities of the project, um, first and foremost, equity is at the center of all of the work of the project. Other priorities include providing services at no cost or low cost, having services delivered by CESA-based uh, EMLSS coaches, and also prioritizing those districts with IDEA level two identifications, um, and those who were previously receiving services through the RTI center. So digging a little deeper into what is available to schools and districts through the project, those schools and districts that are engaged with the project, um, teams will receive regular coaching, which will occur, which occurs twice a month at least. Uh, the coaching is provided to support teams with building skills around effective implementation of EMLSS. Coaches are working 
um, on individualized action plans with those teams, the school and district teams, so that they can help them identify the needs and to plan the delivery of related services as it relates to the implementation of their EMLSS in academics and or around positive behavior interventions and supports. Schools and districts also receive support with the use of self-assessment tools for continuum behavior, for a continuum of behavior supports, including things like the TFI, so the tiered fidelity inventory. There are a number of professional learning offerings through the project for school teams and district teams. They are team-based trainings uh, and they include EMLSS framework training that will take place in each of the CESA regions, as well as trainings around the continuum of behavior support. So in, that includes tier one training, full tier two training and booster trainings. There will also be a pilot around EMLSS for reading, um, another pilot for EMLSS for math and a pilot for EMLSS, the equity within the EMLSS framework. Again, the coaching that goes along with these trainings will include readiness support ahead of the trainings and implementation coaching that goes along with that, as well as being able to provide that local context from the CESA-based coach. Um, this link from the DPI site includes contact information for all of those CESA-based EMLSS coaches. So if you need to get in touch with or find out more information and gain that local context, you can find all of the coaches there. And if you would like to connect with Barb or myself, you have our contact information here on this last slide. So we are here to answer any questions that you have. I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can see everyone though. Does anyone have any questions for Barb or Janine? I don't see any in the chat. Um, I see, I see one. Okay, one. see a new one now. Is there support for writing? Um, there's support at the system level for literacy. So the project works entirely on the system. So that system support would be around what are your screeners, what is included in your universal instruction, what's included in your continuum of supports. Um, we don't have any and we're, we're not um, we're not recommending interventions. In fact, the project staff is would be handing off services if folks wanted to dig into dig further into any aspect of literacy. They the services would be handed off as fee for service to a literacy person at their CESA. At, and I mean, I think we all know there's not a silver bullet for writing. <laughs> um, I would venture to say there are very there really are no interventions available that meet the grade level writing standards, nor are there um, necessarily progress monitoring tools that, that do that either. Um, and the project doesn't have the silver bullet answer to that either. Lisa, does that answer your question? Lisa, does that answer what you're looking for? Yep, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, they're they're together in a space, so that's probably uh, why it's hard. Um, okay. okay, and then there is another question too. What about supports for behavior? It says we, TFI supports to build a system. Yeah, behavior is the one area where we are going beyond the framework itself into a specific behavior system or a specific continuum of supports for behavior. And we are integrating that with the school mental health framework. So we have um, 
a universal behavior supports training that is available at several different CISAs throughout the state. That's um, two virtual half days and two in-person full days. It's a team-based training. We'll also offer um, tier two for continuum of behavior supports later in the year. I don't think we're gonna get to tier three this year. We also have boosters available for teams who have been trained on universal supports or trained on tier two supports in the past. Those are um, full day team based boosters and those will be available at every CISA. As well as coaching for the TFI, the oh my gosh, the, the learning SAS. curve on this for me has the TFI been... and the SAS are the two. Thank you. SAS seems like a word that I should be able to remember, <laughs> uh, especially for those of you who know me. Um, the TFI and the SAS, um, the SAS being a tool that schools and districts can use to get input from families, students, and community members. And one of the things I'm most excited about with um, this current work around the continuum of behavior supports is really privileging the voices of students, families, and community members in building and refining the system. Colleen, is there something else specific that you were looking for information about? That answered it very, very well for me. Thank you, Barb. You are so welcome. Do we have any other questions in the parking lot? Nope. Oh, I see Deb shaking her head. No. Any other questions? Any other questions in the parking lot. The only other thing I would say about the continuum of behavior supports um, is that it's not your grandma's PBIS. Um, like we are not talking about some of the technical things um, that have become part of um, poor PBIS implementation. We are talking about using a framework um, that includes behavior supports and clearly articulating behaviors and recognizing when those behaviors are going well and supporting when those behaviors are not. But we're also talking about culture and climate and talking about the entire framework that supports behavior. I know a lot of people have a bad taste in their mouth around the acronym PBIS. Um, and although that is the name of what we are doing, we are using a nationally researched um, and longstanding framework um, that's about so much more than behavior incentive systems. Any we other? heard you. Oh, sorry, Tyler. Go ahead, Barb. No, go ahead, Barb. <laughs> um, we encourage you to reach out to the coaches in your CISA. Um, the project does strive first to support schools and districts with level two, ID I'm sorry, not schools and districts, districts with level two IDEA identifications. Um, and then schools and districts who've worked with the RTI Center in the past, that is our first priority. Um, but the training opportunities are available to anyone and everyone. Um, the low cost, no cost, um, the no cost coaching is where there, there may not be enough to go around if everyone um, says they are interested. Well, thank you both for sharing this information. I like how you preface it by saying that this is supports versus like something else to do. So it's good to know what resources are available. Right. And, and we that... encourage you to, um, when you contact your coach, contact us together with your general education colleagues um, in this reimagining of what was the RTI Center and is now the EMLSS project. Our staff is includes pretty much an even number of folks who have general education background and special education background. And I think we're really well situated to I mean, you probably don't have silos in your districts the way um, your state education agency might, um, but in case you do have those silos, we're happy to help you break them down.
we're all working to do continuous improvement. So I think we're all on the same page. We appreciate your uh, honesty and um, and even how to navigate moving forward too. So I think we're a little bit ahead of our agenda. Um, what I think might be good, and again, thank you, Barb um, and Janine for joining us. If we could throw the link in the chat again for the survey, just in case folks didn't have time to take that, we can give a few minutes now for folks to take our survey about um, just looking at topics to support with you within the future. And then we had Paul Sherman on the agenda for 1115. And I don't think Paul's on yet. So how long should we break he is for not here? on yet, um, Tanya. I did email him in hopes okay. that he might be able to come on a little bit a early. Little bit. Okay. So um, I think maybe why don't we still take a 10 minute break so people can yep. get up and stretch their legs and um, try and come back maybe by 1105 and hope that Paul sees the email and that he's on okay. early. <laughs> Sounds good. So if you're able to take that, take your break. And if you have time, go ahead and take the survey. So. And Tanya, I just want to note that I did put it in the agenda as well. So if when you're ready. All right, sounds good. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good. All right, I'll share my screen here. And good. Okay. Can everybody see the PowerPoint? Uh, we're still seeing you, Paul. Okay. Hmm. Now, let's see here. Looks like it's going to go not well. We okay. see your computer now. I, I selected the screen to share, but I didn't click the share screen button. So <laughs> <laughs> that was the problem. And Paul, when you're um, done with us today, can you share this PowerPoint with me and I can share it with these folks? Absolutely. Yep. Thank you so much. All right. Does that look better? Sure does. Okay, good. All right. Well, um, so uh, Aaron and Deb asked me if I would do a kind of a 504 overview for uh, some of the new folks, as well as those of you who are old pros with this kind of thing. I've often found that it's just easier to organize my overview of 504 in relation to idea because people generally uh, have more familiarity with the ID requirements and the 504 requirements. So we'll kind of look at those side by side today. All right. So as you know, under IDEA, a student uh, meets the eligibility criteria uh, in a particular eligibility category and is in need of special education. Once you've satisfied those two prongs, then you're considered to be IDEA eligible. 504 is, is broader uh, in terms of eligibility for students with disabilities. The student has to have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. So there's no um, criteria categories uh, under 504 like there are uh, under um, uh, uh, IDEA. And the student doesn't need to demonstrate a need for specially designed instruction in order to be considered under uh, eligible under 504. Um, just do you have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities? And for um, the purposes relevant to us, right, um, 504 considers major life activities to be things like 
um, not just you know walking, breathing, uh, those kinds of things, but also reading, learning, um, speaking, all of those types of things are also major life activities. So it's not very difficult for somebody to have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Um, there are exceptions to that for, the, you know, short term, um, but that's probably more in, in the weeds than, than we need to go into here in today's presentation. Okay. Um, under, uh, for evaluation, under IDEA, the uh, evaluation is conducted by an individualized education program team, as you know. Uh, under 504, the regulations state that the evaluation is conducted by a group of persons with knowledge of uh, the student and the school's program. Um, IDEA, special education and related services are specified in the student's IEP by the student's IEP team. And that's what constitutes essentially a free appropriate public education for the student. Under 504, appropriate educational services designed to meet the student to the same extent as the school meets the needs of students who are not disabled is what constitutes a free appropriate public education under 504. And, and understand that both IDEA and 504 are about um, FAPE for students, although we get there in different ways. Uh, the plan for doing that, of course, under IDEA is the IEP. Under 504, it's a 504 plan. And I will tell you that um, uh, OCR, Office for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Education, has told us through guidance that if you develop a 504 plan using the same process and procedures and forms that you use to develop an IEP, you're going to meet all of the 504 plan requirements. They've also told us that a 504 plan is something that doesn't even need to be written. It can just be kind of a verbal understanding um, between school staff and the parents as to what is going to be provided to allow the student the equal opportunity to participate in the district's program. Um, so if you're careful, you'll probably do something similar to an IEP when you're developing a 504 plan. If you're a devil may care kind of person, um, you might just uh, you know go along with the, with the unwritten plan. I of course don't recommend um, doing that. Um, however, please, when you're developing 504 plans, be sure that you don't um, put IEP on any of the documentation that you're using for the 504 plan that will mislead the parents uh, and um, you know kind of create all sorts of misunderstandings that you don't want to have in existence um, when you're working with a 504 student. Idea reevaluation, as you know, is required every three years. Uh, the only guidance we get um, for reevaluation under the 504 regulations is that reevaluation must be done periodically. Um, so, as with lots of civil rights laws that we look at, you're looking at reasonableness. You know, was there some reason um, that a reasonable person would look at and say, oh, that's a reason to reevaluate the student? Um, it would be what periodically is. And of course, if you wanted to maintain a three year schedule uh, similar to IDEA, that would probably be reasonable as well. And uh, uh, OCR would probably tell you, well, you're essentially following what the IDEA requirements are. So as we say in other contexts, if you reevaluate a 504 student every three years, um, you're probably going to be uh, on the good side of the law with that as well. Okay. When it comes to dispute resolution, um, under IDEA, of course, we have mediation available. We've got the state complaint process and we have due process available. Uh, under 504, um, the Department of Public Instruction and the Office for Civil Rights uh, doesn't provide as much assistance with dispute resolution as we do under IDEA. 504 regulations require each district to have its own 504 grievance procedures in place. Um, there is 
um, specified in the 504 regulations, a right that parents and students have to a due process hearing over 504 disputes. Um, but the school district is obligated to arrange for an independent hearing officer and um, a, a due process hearing on their own. Um, the uh, due process system that's set up in Wisconsin for IDEA due process complaints is not accessible for 504 due process requests. So the district will have to do that on their own. Parents can file Office for Civil Rights complaints over 504 issues. Um, but as my, under, my understanding is basically, they're going to look at that and say, well, does the district have a grievance procedure? Did you use uh, the district's grievance procedure and due process procedure? And if uh, the parent had access to those and used them, um, the Office for Civil Rights is probably just going to say, well, that was, you know, that's how you got resolved then uh, through those two processes, unless there was something significantly wrong with the process. Okay. Um, for um, private school students, um, child find and evaluation is the same. You know, under IDEA, we provide equitable services to private, parentally placed private school students, not FAPE. Um, we provide those services using a service plan that's developed using the IEP process, but not an IEP, and it only specifies the equitable services that are provided to the student. Um, uh, there is dispute resolution available for private school students. You can file a state complaint or you can file a due process related to child find issues only. Under 504, um, the, first of all, this is confusing to a lot of parents, so you may get questions about this, but um, the 504 requirements don't apply to private schools. Um, so uh, private schools themselves don't need to write 504 plans for students who are attending private schools. Um, and they don't really even need to follow the non-discrimination provisions of 504 to the same extent that public schools do. When it comes to uh, the role of public schools for um, students who may be potentially eligible under 504, um, there is no equitable services requirement. So a student who might be 504 eligible is not required not entitled to any equitable services while attending a private school. Um, there is no funding that comes through 504 to school districts like the idea of part B um, funding that comes to public school districts. So there's no set aside funds that need to be expended on private school students. Um, we often have questions from um, private schools and private school parents, can you evaluate my child for 504? Um, and the answer to that is yes, there's a child find requirement under 504, just like there is under IDEA. So if a student comes to you and says, I'd like to be evaluated under 504, um, you would assemble a, a 504 evaluation team, again, with those people who have knowledge about the student and the situation, and you would essentially make a determination about whether the child has um, a physical or mental impairment that affects one or more major life activities. And that's really about all the farther you need to go in that situation. Um, unless the parents indicate they want to enroll the student in the public school. Um, because to go ahead and develop a 504 plan um, for a student in a private school would be kind of a moot activity, right? Because that private school would have no obligation to um, follow the 504 plan. And the public school 504 team probably would not have the type of knowledge it would need anyways to specify what appropriate accommodations and supports under a 504 plan a child would need in that type of situation. So there <clears throat> may be an obligation to conduct an evaluation, but in terms of developing a 504 plan, 
Probably not unless the private school student and their parents decide to then enroll in the public school. Um, for home-based education or homeschool students, there is no FAPE or equitable services requirement under IDEA for those students. Um, however, child find and evaluation still applies. Um, 504, of course, does not apply in those situations as students not attending public school, unless the student is a homeschool student who is participating uh, in uh, the public school program. I th you know, there are some homeschool rules about um, homeschool students being able to participate in a couple of classes in a school year or maybe be uh, participating in an extracurricular activity. Um, if that happens, 504 applies in those situations and there would need to be a 504 team to determine eligibility and develop a 504 plan only to be applied during those times when the student is participating in a public school um, program. Those students who are participating part-time, just a side note for you, are not IDEA eligible. So um, you could theoretically do um, a, an IDEA evaluation for those students in that situation, but they are not entitled to an IEP uh, when they're participating in those public school programs on a part-time basis. Okay. Um, discipline is uh, something that we need to be concerned about with 504 eligible uh, students. If you're going to um, suspend a student for more than 10 consecutive days, um, which in Wisconsin, as you know, usually means expulsion, there is a manifestation determination required. And again, if you follow the idea, uh, manifestation determination um, kind of policies and procedures, you're, you'll be doing okay with the, doing the manifestation determination for 504. However, um, if you find that um, the student behavior was not a manifestation of uh, their disability and you go ahead and expel the student, um, there is no ongoing FAPE requirement for expelled students under um, IDEA. Um, so, you know, our IDEA eligible students, you need to continue to provide them regular education, special education while they're expelled, um, but you would not need to do that for a 504 student. Okay could continue to provide educational services for them, but you're not mandated to do that by the provisions of 504. If you have uh, you know, more questions about the 504 and discipline, um, OCR does have a publication that's linked here on this slide uh, that you can refer to for specific questions about 504 discipline guidance. 504, uh, unlike idea is specific in its non-discrimination um, requirements as well. Um, basically, no qualified handicapped person shall on the basis of handicap be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or otherwise be subject to discrimination under any program or activity which receives federal financial assistance. And that's all of our public schools in Wisconsin receive federal financial assistance. So we're obligated under 504 not to discriminate against those students. So um, the 504, you know, applies in terms of harassment, um, uh, excluding students from participation in not only the school day, um, but also any extracurricular programs. Um, 504 is something we also need to be aware of in terms of its non-discrimination provisions um, with um, uh, summer school, right? Uh, sometimes students IEPs specify extended school year services and therefore they're receiving FAPE IEP services during that ESY period. Um, but even if their IEP team doesn't specify that they need ESY, if they're eligible to and elect to participate in the district summer school program, um, 504 applies in that situation and um, the, um, the accommodations may 
be need to be made in order to allow the student to be able to participate um, without being discriminated on the basis of their disability. Uh, 504 is also in its non-discrimination provisions is interesting because um, not only um, do you are you actually um, protected from discrimination if you actually have a disability, but you're also predict protected from discrimination if you're regarded as having um, uh, an impairment. In other words, even though you may not have a particular impairment, people perceive that you do and are making decisions on that basis in terms of um, how you're allowed to participate in the school's program. So uh, it, again, kind of a broad protection for people who have a disability or are perceived as having a disability. Now, one thing to be careful about this with though is that the regarded or perceived as having a disability does not establish actual eligibility for a 504 plan, right? So you, you actually do have to have a disability to get a 504 plan, not just be regarded as having one. Uh, I have on this slide some resources for you. The 504 regulations um, are linked there. OCR has a couple of good documents. They have a, a frequently asked questions document that can help out when you have 504 questions. Um, they also have the, the protecting students with disabilities document is something that I frequently print off or link to and share with parents who have uh, questions about um, the whole process. Um, that's a, a parent friendly document and it kind of gives them um, kind of sort of a a basic knowledge about 504 and uh, what uh, what the provisions of it are. Okay. Um, you can call us here on the special education team for idea questions. We can also kind of handle the general um, uh, orientation to 504. Where should I go next? Um, uh, you know, where can I look for eligibility criteria, all that kind of thing we can help you with here on the special ed team. Um, but for more uh, detailed questions, you know, I've, I've got a student with X, Y, and Z, parents are asking for A, B, and C, what should I do? Um, the best place that you should start those types of questions is with the U.S. Department of Education Office for Civil Rights. Their regional office is in Chicago. Uh, they cover all Wisconsin school districts and I've got their direct telephone number there for you on this slide. So that brings me to the end of my prepared remarks. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have at this point, so. Well, Paul, we have a number of questions in our chat and I'm not sure okay. what's in the parking lot. So I'll go to the first question in the chat it was for Monica. Mm -hmm. um, it says if a team determines 504 eligibility, but then determines that there are no reasonable accommodations or educational services that are needed, what should the next steps be? Are they not eligible or is there no plan created? Right, if, if, if you determine that there are is nothing that the school can provide or, or the, the student needs in order to be able to access the programming on an act on a on a on an equal basis with their non-disabled peers then uh, there is no 504 plan developed for that student and the process is just i think just kind of at an end at that point so that question kind of reminded me of sometimes schools have practices in place, but maybe they're not practices that other schools do. So they have practices for all students. Mm -hmm. So maybe thinking through like if there are if there's something the student truly needs, whether it's like audiobooks or something like that, maybe that's something to consider as well. Because if they move to a different sure. school where that's right. not a common practice. Mm -hmm. But the yeah. student would still be eligible for 504 protection. So you can't discriminate against them based on their disability. That's that's absolutely right, Kari. Yeah. That that they they because you because the team is determined they have a, a physical or mental impairment that impacts one or more major life activities, then they're protected by the 504 non-discrimination protections. But the, the issue of what accommodations they need, if the team determines they don't need any, 
then there's no reason to develop a 504 plan. And of course, you can consider regular ed interventions for, for that kind of student as well. Um, you know, the parent might disagree with that. And then that at that point, that's where you need to make available your dispute resolution options that 504 requires you to have available, so. So you would maintain the eligibility report that the, the 504 team did, um, but then just note that there was no plan needed. So to Kari's point that there there's documentation that they're still eligible for the protections under 504. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and I will say, um, you know, that's, that's because you've done, you've got that documentation because you've done the, the evaluation, but students under are protected under 504 from disability discrimination, even if there hasn't been an evaluation done. Right. So if the student actually has a disability, you still can't discriminate against them, even if you haven't done an evaluation. So. Thank you. I I was just gonna, oh, sorry, can you mute? Um, two things, uh, Paul, can you, I think part of this is a semantics issue when it comes to what we think of when we talk about disability in regards to IDEA, because there's two standards for eligibility to determine disability, which mm -hmm. is they have a, a disability, they've eligible and, and they need special education. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, I do think there's maybe confusion when we're talking about what we in special education deem to be a disability right. versus then when you have a 504, yep, mm -hmm. they have a, some, a diagnosis, a disability that impacts a life function, but they didn't need special education. Yep. So then, but, so I, I think there's confusion out there, um, or at least we have to get right with what we mean by that when we're talking about each 504 versus special education. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one part. And then if you can address the private school, because there's there's differences in um, what I'm reading and what I've been told regarding private schools and receiving federal funds mm -hmm. and whether or not, what whether it's title, whether it's idea, whether it's they get, they're part of the federal milk program, what their obligation is to provide 504. Uh, right. So can you can you clarify that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, well, I'll, I'll take that that one first, right? So I've been Sorry, told by the the folks at OCR <laughs> that there is no private school in Wisconsin that is a recipient of federal funds that triggers 504, right? So that's <laughs> it's just the, like and and pe parents will ask me that and schools folks will ask me that yeah but they're getting lunch funds or they're getting title funds and um you know whatever legal analysis is done there it, it's just been determined that that type of funding is not triggering the 504 responsibility for the private schools so um so uh, clarifying 504 versus IDEA eligibility, right? So when we say special education, right, for IDEA, I think of that as specially designed instruction, right? And that's what makes the student IDEA eligible. Um, supplementary aids and services, as we think about that in IDEA, um, related services, as we think about that in IDEA, you know, um, those are the types of things that might go in a 504 plan for a student who doesn't need specially designed instruction. Okay, so uh, um, I get asked every now and then, can we put speech and language therapy in a 504 plan? Yes, you can. Can we put um, OTPT in a speech in a 504 plan? Yeah. Okay. Um, can we put an aid in a 504 plan? Yes. Okay, um, and you're you're doing all that just under 504, and as long as the student's not in need of specially designed instruction, they don't they're not eligible under IDEA, and you don't develop an IEP. So um, that I, I kind of think of the difference uh, as it being in the services, right? Now I'll throw a, a um, one at you where 
um, several years ago, we had some very stubborn parents who were the kind who did, you are not going to say my student is a special ed student and I don't want an IEP. That's bad for her mental health to have an IEP. Um, and the district said, okay, um, here's your, you can you know, revoke consent for services and this is all gonna go away. And then the parent turned around and said, and I want a 504 plan. <laughs> and that actually went to OCR on a complaint and OCR said, you have to give that student a 504 plan. And if necessary, you have to provide specially designed instruction in the 504 plan. Um, it, it's just a, you know, now, I'm not saying that's the normal way of things, right? But just, you know, so that student wound up with essentially what was an IEP, but everybody called it a 504 plan. And that made the parents happy, I guess. So, but, um, but for the, most of the time, you can keep the two apart, kind of uh, based thinking about what services the person needs. Yeah, Perry said something different than that, I'm sure, but <laughs> OCR is the ultimate boss about what, what happens so with 504. So. Okay. Other questions? Thoughts? I needed that answer. Answer what you were looking for there. Otherwise, there are a few more questions. We can circle back around to, um, there was Lisa Wing had a question and it did talk about OTPT speech and language as related services. Can that be included? You just hit on that, mm -hmm. Paul. Um, do you need to review the 504 yearly and is it time bound like an IEP? Yeah. Um, I, again, there's hardly any thing in the 504 regulations that talk about any kind of procedure. Um, so again, I would say if you're, because the idea requirement is an annual review, would you be, and OCR has said you can follow the idea procedures with 504 plans, would an annual review of a 504 plan be a good idea? Yep. But there may be situations where it can go longer. There may be situations where you need to do it more frequently. It's just, you know, it's just one of those things, um, you know, kind of like we do with IEPs. Is the 504 plan having its intended effect? If it's not, then we probably need to meet again to review and revise it, so. CIS 11 directors say, are saying different legal terms are uh, providing different information. Some say that manifest determination is not something a person with a 504 plan is entitled to under section 504 and others are saying yes, thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I know, it's a must. Um, the The manifestation is a must. And I think that document that I linked on my slide about the discipline protections from OCR says that pretty directly. So um, that would be the, the resource I would use to answer that question. Okay. Nikki Smith said, regarding as having a disability versus actually having a disability, how is that determined through an evaluation question mark, doctor diagnoses question mark? Uh, no, um, so that regarded as would probably come up more in the context of the discrimination area and particularly with harassment, right? Um, so the, har the alleged harasser is harassing somebody because they believe they perceive them to have an intellectual disability, right? Um, that that type of um, behavior would be prohibited under 504 perceived as protection, right? And you wouldn't necessarily, that the alleged victim of that um, behavior would not need to prove that they actually do have an intellectual disability to pr be protected against that type of harassment, just that the, the harasser was doing that because they believed the person had the disability, so. And then I think we caught up on the conversation with Kari, Brenda, and Kelly, which was previously about um, services and that comment you had, Paul, about Perry's Urkel, um, about saying something different. 
Um, so then we were on to Angie said, are there examples of dispute resolution documents somewhere? We have students that will get prescribed a 504 from a doctor, but then the district does not feel it's necessary. The parents continue to push for the 504 and our staff are overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, no, there are <laughs> There aren't any, you know, DPI doesn't publish model 504 forms. Um, as neither does OCR, the US Department of Education. Some districts may have developed their own, um, but they don't share those with us necessarily. So if you're lucky enough to be in a district where you've developed those kinds of forms, um, look for them. If not, you might ask, you know, ask around your neighboring district, see if they have anything. Um, I believe that um, LRP might have some model 504 forms available. Um, so for those of you who subscribe to um, uh, like a special education update, those kinds of services, you might be able to find um, something in there. Um, or, you know, maybe, um, what is it, NALA, the, you know, the kind of big national forms, uh, policies and procedures folks, they might um, have something available for you as well. So um, I think okay. if a parent comes to you with a prescription, right, that's not um, just like under IDEA, doctors can't prescribe 504, they can't prescribe special education. Um, but if the parent wants you to do a 504 evaluation, you need to do the 504 evaluation. That's part of the child find obligation. Um, and don't just kind of independently of assembling a group of people with knowledge about the situation, don't you know predetermine that, right? Don't just say, well, no, we're, we're just going to ignore that and not do an evaluation. That I think would have the potential to get you crosswise with the law, so. Um, then there was some more information. Heidi and Kari were having a chat to Heidi, did you have something that you wanted? Any other further questions that you wanted to add? Well, regarding. sorry, Rachel, do you want to sorry. <laughs> She has to mute me. No, this is a good conversation, but my point is that Kari's right as far as a 504 is intended for different, like anti-discrimination, right? But the assumption is that first is that they have a disability, but I would argue that if a, if a doctor writes a note or a parent comes and says, my doctor said my kid has this disability, we are still obligated to go through an evaluation, whatever that looks like, whether it's a separate 504 or whether you, you do an idea eval um, and to determine disability, right? So that's, mm -hmm. that's where I'm saying it's not an automatic, nor it should be, as long as you're following the process by which you're determining that and using that information then from the doctor or from the the perspective of the student and its impact on the life activity, which the assumption is it's impacting school. That's the point. So anyway, that, that was it. So you do the eval to show. School. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's true. And, and I'm glad you said that last part, Heidi, which is that many students will have, um, you know, a physical or mental impairment that impacts one or more major life activities. But it actually has to, in order for you to go ahead and develop a 504 plan, the impact has to impact school. You're absolutely right about that, Heidi, um, because that's the whole point of the 504 plan is to make school accessible. It's not to make um, a job accessible or home life accessible you know, or the, the uh, public bus system in your community accessible. It's to make the school accessible. So those things major life activities have to be things that are affected at school in order to be to, to make sense to go forward with developing a 504 plan. Then Monica shared in the chat, she said, I think it's been tricky with the Department of Ed guidance on ADHD. And then, then she has a link to that. And I don't know if Monica, if you want to add any more. Yeah, I think this is, this is where, um, 
we get stuck frequently Mm -hmm. now it's that a doctor may say that the child has ADHD. They're recommending, you know, a 504 plan. Um, And then with this guidance, it really does talk about Mm -hmm. ADHD being a pretty much eligible um, diagnosis Um, and then that it affects thinking. So then it affects school. Right. Mm -hmm. But then we have students who um, may not need accommodations as we, as we see them. Right. And the parents are saying, but it does affect them at school um, because it affects thinking because, you know, the Department of Ed said so. So I think it's just it's really tricky. But as long as we go through the evaluation process, it sounds like we're 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 okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Don't. um, Yeah, there there is no, you know, condition that requires you to provide that per se requires you to provide. Um, accommodations and supports under a 504 plan. That's an individualized determination. That That is at the core of all disability law is it's got to be an individualized determination. So you can't just rule out whole classes of people and you don't rule in whole classes of people either. So Kelly just added, always follow the process. It's your friend. And there's <laughs> comments there agreeing with that. Are there any other questions in the parking lot? No. Any other questions for Paul or any other comments? Obviously, this is a hot topic and it's good to talk, you know, to bring up each year and talk about how things are going. Yeah, well, and and I I I hope I provided a little light. I know I didn't provide a whole lot, but that's just it. <laughs> some, some time ago, OCR told us, you know, mind your own business <laughs> when it comes to 504. So <laughs> they, they, uh, they, they didn't like us mucking around in there. So, <laughs> But it's nice that you took the time to do the comparisons. And I think that's very helpful. Brenda, I think you were trying to talk. Yes. And Paul, you bring much light to our space. So thank you for <laughs> thank your you. wisdom. <laughs> thank you. All right. Last call for questions for Paul. All right. Well, thank you, Paul, okay. for joining yep. us. We appreciate you popping on early too. So yep. you're Thanks, welcome. Paul. Bye-bye. Yeah. All right, I will do one last plug for the survey that was shared in, in the chat too. So if you can help us out with that, that would be great. Um, a reminder that our next virtual virtual leader session will be on November 8th from 9 to 12. So it's a change. Sometimes they start at 9, sometimes they're at 10. It's just a longer session. Um, we are going to have Barb Van Heeren with us talking about the Attract and Retain Teacher Induction Program. Uh, we will also have Carolyn Hidby and Don Mirth Johnson talking about workload guidance and considerations, practical tips and tools. So, and the registration is on CESA 8 for anyone looking to get that Zoom link. Any other last minute updates? Nope, Erin's shaking her head no, Deb's shaking her head no. So that's it for today. We thank you for taking the time to join us and hope you have a good rest of your day.